Hi, everyone, and welcome again to our fourth eTech webinar. And the topic of our webinar is how you can help global initiatives and calls to action to stop forced organ harvesting in China. My name is Anshu, and I'll be your host for today. To begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the many lands of which we meet today and pay our respect to the elders past and present. ETAC's Empowerment and Accountability Series has been designed to support advocates from the victim communities and the supporters. We also welcome people from outside those communities to attend and engage with the issue of forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience in China. Our main speaker today is our co-founder and executive director of ETAG, Susie Hughes. I would also like to welcome Nurgal Sowat, Miriam Karmali, Enver Tohti, Dr. Norman Epstein, and Dr. Alia Khan, who will be contributing to our today's webinar. Thank you, Susie, you may begin. Thanks very much, um, Anshu. Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to come on to the webinar today. Uh, to begin, I'll take a minute or two to give a quick overview of forced organ harvesting for those who have not attended the previous webinars and as a recap for those who have. So victims who are killed through the Chinese government's forced organ harvesting are primarily people who have been imprisoned due to their faith or ethnicity, including the Buddhist Qigong practice of Falun Gong and Uyghurs. Evidence indicates that house church Christians and Tibetans, Buddhists, may also be killed for their organs. And it is quite possible that other people of faith, democracy, activists, and those who hold opinions unacceptable to the Chinese Communist Party could be drawn into the victim pool. In 2017, ETAC approached expert in crimes of mass atrocity, Sir Geoffrey Nice QC, for an independent legal opinion. Sir Geoffrey advised a People's Tribunal be formed and as chair worked pro bono with the tribunal for 12 months reviewing all available evidence. The tribunal concluded that forced organ harvesting was indeed happening and that Commission of Crimes Against Humanity against the Falun Gong and Uyghurs had been proved beyond reasonable doubt. The tribunal reviewed many lines of evidence. A few of those were medical tests of Falun Gong practitioners and Uyghurs that included forced CT scans, X-rays and ultrasound. Information from official Chinese websites indicating China is conducting far more transplant operations than they claim. Websites where hospitals advertised transplant services to foreigners on a pre-scheduled basis, including for heart transplants. Telephone investigations to Chinese transplant specialists confirming waiting times as short as two weeks, with some calls stating that Falun Gong organs are available and a statistical analysis that shows current official Chinese organ donation data has been manipulated and does not represent the real numbers. The reference to all evidence can be found in the judgment on their website at chinatribunal.com. Evidence is continuing to build, particularly around the concerns that Uyghurs are now harvested for their organs on a mass scale. The China Tribunal judgment has provided the independent legal analysis needed for governments, organisations and individuals to act. So now I'll just take a moment to share my screen and I'll run through a list of things that you can do to help end forced organ harvesting as an individual or as part of an organisation. And we'll also hear from our five guest speakers who we're very pleased could join us today. Okay, so hopefully now you'll be able to see my screen. <laughs> I can't see what you can see. So let's get started. The very first step is simple, it's to be informed. Uh, the ETAC webinar series has been created specifically to inform and support advocates in their work. And we have videos of the past webinars so that you can watch if you haven't attended and we encourage you to do so. You can watch the China Tribunal eight minute video and read the short form judgment. Of course, we also encourage everyone to have a good look through the full judgment. It's very interesting and provides information on specific evidence and explains the reasoning behind the judgment that forced organ harvesting is happening. 
we encourage you to read the ETAC information sheets that are provided. And there's a few of those. There's what is forced organ harvesting, an overview. There's an organ harvesting sheet on the Uyghurs, understanding the evidence, and an overview of the China Tribunal and judgment. And we have some more information sheets coming soon to help people with their work. You can join ETAC's latest news so that you're up to date with global developments. It's easy to do. Just go to our website at ntransplantabuse.org. And you can also watch documentaries and share them. There's a number of like, really interesting award-winning documentaries on the ETAC website as well, and we'll send out links to those after, ne after this presentation. Um, so another thing that you can do is write to your government representatives. So this is where legislation breakthroughs start. It only takes one government representative who is motivated to take action to get something started in regards to possible legislation, resolutions and public statements. ETAC has an example letter you can look at and you can modify it to your own needs. We advise that you include the information sheets so that the government representative you communicate with can gain a quick and easy overview of the issue and also provide the China Tribunal judgment. If you find that the representative is supportive and wants to do something, ETAC can also support you. Just contact us at that time and we'll assist the process so that you can work with that representative and support them to take action. The next one may seem obvious, but it's worth mentioning. Talk about forced organ harvesting and include it in your advocacy. Even if you're working on the persecution of Falun Gong or the persecution of the Uyghurs or any of any issue that's you know around that, you can always still mention forced organ harvesting and and give information sheets on it so that it, so that people become more aware that this is a, a very serious issue that needs to be addressed. Um, after the China Tribunal's work assessing the evidence, there's been a significant shift. News outlets now often mention organ harvesting when listing the human rights abuses perpetrated by the Chinese state. The narrative on the persecution of Falun Gong and Uyghurs should always mention forced organ harvesting. Falun Gong practitioners tend to do this as the issue's been around for some time and we encourage the Uyghur community to do the same. For example, incarceration, forced labour, forced sterilisation and forced organ harvesting. If you don't know much about the evidence, you can still mention it is happening and you can provide the information sheets that, you, that have been prepared by experts to support your advocacy efforts. If you come across someone in a leadership position who's interested to know more, ETAC can arrange an expert to speak with that person and you can of course also be present at that meeting. Support each other. So mention, mentioning other victim groups. The Chinese Communist Party aims to divide and turn people against each other. However, there's strength in numbers and in supporting each other. Whilst evidence is lacking, we believe that Tibetan Buddhists and House Christians have also been drawn into the victim pool. At this stage, there's only a limited number of testimonies that state that people from these groups have experienced the same forced medical tests in detention as Falun Gong practitioners and Uyghurs. The evidence of Falun Gong practitioners being killed for organs is extensive and conclusive. This evidence sets the scene. It demonstrates that these crimes are happening. The evidence that Falun Gong practitioners have been killed on a mass scale and that the number of transplants actually mass scale and that the number of transplants actually happening are far more than officially claimed, and that organs have and continue to be available on demand is important because it proves what is taking place. The evidence of who the victims are, for example, the forced organ scans of Uyghurs in detention, along with other evidence as outlined by Ethan Gutman in the last webinar, and there's an information sheet and a video on that if you missed it. Um, it's then combined with that picture to show that others are now drawn into the victim pool. Uh, using the free materials that we have available. So the documents available to you at the moment, uh, there's a, a document called What is Forced Organ Harvesting? An Overview of the Evidence written by Professor Wendy Rogers and we'll be sending that out this week. Um, and that can be used in your advocacy. Uh, there's forced organ harvesting from Uyghurs and other minorities in Xinjiang or East Turkestan, uh, understanding the evidence. At the moment, we've sent out a short memo that's been distributed and there's a longer report coming. Uh, an overview of the China Tribunal and judgment 
and there's also a new information flyer that's being uh, developed so that you can print it or use it as a PDF. How would you use it? That's probably also obvious. On the street, in your advocacy emails, give it to government representatives, medical practitioners, colleagues, family and friends. Uh, sign and share petitions. So we'll hear from Miriam from Freedom United soon regarding a specific campaign you can support. And we'll also send through some links to other petitions that you can sign and share. You can join existing efforts. So in addition to your own individual actions, you can of course join group efforts. So social media posting is really very important, as I'm sure you all know. Um, we're creating, we're currently connecting with individuals and organisations who are interested to post social media content about forced organ harvesting to their own networks. In the past, there's been a lack of social media content about forced organ harvesting, but a content creation team's now been formed. So participation is easy. Just contact us to join the network and you'll be added to a platform where you can pick up social media content to post it whenever you can. If you're interested to support content creation, we'll introduce you to the content creation manager who can provide quotes and text that can be incorporated into meme designs. We'll also be creating very short video quotes and comments from speeches and webinars and media articles as they become available. It's important that social media content is accurate, so ETAC will support with proofing all of the content before it is released to the network for posting. This upholds the integrity of the issue. Social media is powerful, and if content goes out that isn't accurate, it can actually damage the cause. So working together, we can post information about this issue across multiple platforms and help people understand what's going on. Uh, urging medical bodies to act. It's time for universities, hospitals and global transplantation and medical organisations to sever ties with China in relation to organ transplantation, research and training. Join letter campaigns to help make this happen. The Dr. Elia Khan will talk about a global campaign very soon that you can support. In addition, we'd like to connect with organisations who are interested to know about future joint communications to inform and call these bodies to action. So if you are part of an organisation or you know someone that is, they can contact us and, and join the network. And that way, basically, we just send an email out when there's a new initiative happening with the opportunity to sign on and support. Uh, issuing a public statement of concern. We're also asking organisations to issue a public statement of concern regarding forced organ harvesting. To date, statements have been received by a wide range of organisations, including Christian Solidarity Worldwide, the APPG on Human Trafficking and Modern Slavery, Freedom United, the Uyghur Human Rights Project, the Raoul Wallenberg Centre for Human Rights and Australian Lawyers for Human Rights. And you can see a few more there on the screen. The statements are an important step in demonstrating that the issue is not going away and that momentum is building. They also provide an important push for calls to action for those outside of China. Examples of these statements are on the ETAC website and we'll send out a link um, in the follow-up email after the webinar. You can support current legislation initiatives. So the US Stop Forced Organ Harvesting Bill. This bill was introduced in December and dates are currently being confirmed for the bill to be reintroduced this year. There are a range of organisations who are already supporting the bill and urging for co-sponsorship. The momentum needs to continue to build with more and more organisations are needed. If you're part of an organisation or you know someone in an organisation, you can urge them to support the bill. We can provide you with a letter that explains the bill and gives the contact details for how to support. If you're an individual, you can also use this letter for encouraging your government representatives to step forward and support the bill. Just let us know you'd like to be linked in um, to this work if you're in the United States. ETAC has been working with the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, the Falun Dafa Association of Washington DC, the Lantos Foundation for Human Rights and the Uyghur Human Rights Project and other organisations to get this bill going. The bill is now going to need as much support as possible 
um, so that it's passed into law. Uh, the Canadian Bill S204. The purpose of this bill is to allow prosecution in Canada and to bar entry to Canada of those partaking in organ transplant abuse abroad. Efforts are currently focused on expediating the passage of the bill by making it a government bill. Making the bill a government bill would expand the availability of parliamentary time available to enact the bill. Since the bill has all party support, the amount of time necessary to get the bill enacted should be minimal. If you are in Canada and you would like to support, we can put you in touch with the ETAC Canadian Committee and another group chaired by Dr. Aliyah Khan, who meet regularly to support efforts to end forced organ harvesting. And in Australia, work is beginning for similar legislation. We'll need the support of as many organisations as possible once the initial steps are underway. If you're interested to support, please contact us so that you can link into that process and you can help during the different stages where support is needed. And we'll hear from Nerigal soon, who's very active with work on this issue in Australia. And finally, the UK Medicines and Medical Devices Bill. I won't go into that now uh, because we have Miriam who will mention uh, some good news about that soon. Uh, there is a joint letter that has been sent to UN member states urging for a commission of inquiry into forced organ harvesting. We're urging organisations to continue to sign on to the letter. If you're, once again, if you're part of a group or organisation, um, you can contact us. We'll send you the letter to have a look at and we can also meet and discuss uh, urging UN member states to raise this issue at the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council. So I've been asked in the past whether these actions have any hope of stopping the organ harvesting happening in China and there are of course many other actions that you can take as well. Um, and uh, you know, after all, it's a Chinese regime. My answer is that it's always important never to lose hope. And whilst we can do something, we should. Atrocities that aren't addressed worsen. Just look at what's happened over this issue in regards to Falun Gong practitioners being killed for their organs for the last 20 years. We're now seeing Uyghurs being drawn into that victim pool on a mass scale. If countries outside of China are called to account to do what they can, and if hospitals, universities and corporations abide by their business and human rights obligations and cut ties with China in relation to organ transplantation research and training, if Chinese perpetrators are sanctioned, and if Chinese transplant surgeons are forbidden from presenting at international conferences and from publishing in academic journals, then the pressure will build. As Sir Geoffrey Nice QC stated when delivering the China Tribunal judgment, governments and any who interact in any substantial way with the PRC, including doctors and medical institutions, industry and businesses, most specifically airlines, travel companies, financial services, businesses, law firms, and pharmaceutical insurance companies, together with individual tourists, educational establishments, art establishments, should now recognise that they are, to the extent revealed in this document, interacting with a criminal state. Now, I've also got up on the top there on the right-hand side, the students take action now against China's extreme crimes, the stance movement, and um, Dr. Norman Epstein will be talking about that soon. So it's up to um, those of us who care to bring this issue to the attention of good people everywhere. We hope that you'll be interested to support even in a small way and many small actions make a big difference and ultimately together we can help stop this atrocity. I'll now hand back over to Anshu who will be introducing our next speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Before we move on to our guest speakers, we would like to do a quick poll and hope you'll participate to help us in our work. Just click on the poll link on your screen. I'll share you with you right now. Yeah, and you'll see a link on your screen to read the questions and, and submit your answers. The question for the first poll is, which ETAC advocacy resources are you interested to use? Free resources. You will see the choices under the questions. Mm 
While we, you are selecting your answers, I would like to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Miriam Kamarli, Senior Advocacy Officer at Freedom United, the largest modern anti-slavery community in the world. ETEC is proud to be partnering with Freedom United on this issue. Miriam will provide information on a campaign you can support, along with some news of progress in the UK. Please welcome Miriam. Hi everyone, I hope that you can see and hear me. Thank you, Anshu, Susie and ETAC for organising and inviting me to be part of this really important event. Um, as Anshu mentioned this evening, I'm going to be talking about the Freedom United campaign to stop forced organ harvesting and organ trafficking that we launched in partnership with ETAC and the Human Traf Trafficking Foundation and how you can get involved in the campaign. So, as we know, forced organ harvesting and organ trafficking are horrific crimes and lesser known forms of modern slavery, and many of us may not automatically associate these crimes with contemporary forms of slavery. For those of you who aren't familiar with Freedom United, we are a global advocacy and public campaigning organisation and the world's largest anti-modern slavery community, working to tackle all forms of modern slavery, including forced organ harvesting. We are really proud to partner with ETAC and the Human Trafficking Foundation on our campaign, calling on all national legislatures to take up legislation to address forced organ harvesting and organ trafficking, so that these crimes can be effectively tackled at the international level. To date, only seven countries, South Korea, Belgium, Norway, Italy, Taiwan, Spain and Israel, have passed legislation to combat forced organ harvesting, organ transplant tourism and organ trafficking. Despite clear evidence of forced organ harvesting in China that has been already set out by Susie this evening, people are travelling abroad to procure organs that may have been taken from victims through force or coercion, sold illegally and then often making their way into the organ tourism transplant market. And on top of that, research suggests that 28% of organ recipients in China today are foreigners. This is why we need to be raising awareness of forced organ harvesting taking place in China and elsewhere to ensure that nobody thinks it's acceptable to travel abroad and purchase an organ, given the risk of these organs being associated with trafficking and forced organ harvesting. We must also continue to mobilise public action to urge our governments to recognise the severity of these crimes by passing legislation to tackle them. We are seeing progress from states who are addressing the issue of forced organ harvesting. As Susie mentioned in her presentation, a bill is being tabled in Canada to strengthen criminal penalties against individuals intentionally involved in organ trafficking and forced organ harvesting. And since launching our campaign in June last year, the UK government has since backed an amendment to the Medicines and Medical Devices Bill. Medicines manufactured with human tissue from forced organ harvesting victims could be imported into the National Health Service due to the absence of comprehensive traceability regulations. But the significance of this amendment is that it seeks to give authorities in the UK greater powers to prevent forced organ harvesting from impacting the UK's National Health Service by being able to prevent human tissue and medicines manufactured from forced organ harvesting victims from entering the UK health system. We are really proud to have worked with ETAC and Lord Hunt of Kings Heath, who tabled the amendment to raise awareness of the importance of this amendment that passed through the UK's upper house just last week and is expected to pass into law in the spring. Over 24,000 supporters from around the world have signed the Freedom United petition, building pressure on national governments to address forced organ harvesting and organ trafficking. But we do need to keep building the momentum. Your voice does make a difference, and the more of us who are raising awareness of forced organ harvesting and organ trafficking, the greater the chances of keeping these issues in the public eye and pushing governments to act. So please take action by signing the petition. You can find it on freedomunited.org forward slash advocate and share the campaign with your networks on social media or simply by word of mouth, because together our individual actions can have a huge impact. I'd just like to thank um, Susie and Andrew again for having me this evening. And whilst I can't stay for the Q&A section, 
if you do have any questions about the campaign or Food United's work, I'll be more than happy to answer them after the event. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, Dr. Norman Epstein is our next speaker. Dr. Epstein is an emergency physician and a member of ETAC Canadian, Canadian Committee. He will be speaking about the student movement. Please, Dr. Norman, uh, you're welcome. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Anshu. Um, and thank you for the privilege and honor of speaking. Edmund Burke, the great political philosopher of the 18th century said, and I quote, evil triumphs when good people do nothing. Although there are other iterations of this idea, it is central to rising up whenever unconscionable injustices emerge. The human rights violation, crimes against humanity in China are the most egregious in the 21st century. These crimes perpetrated by the Chinese government against its own people, most notably forced organ harvesting, flies under the public radar. But we need to make it soar into the public consciousness. Only with such determined effort will human rights respecting countries be persuaded to join together to stop it. It has been almost three years that this ETAC Student Action Committee has formed and planning to launch a student movement. It comprises 10 ETAC members from six countries. Our vision is to build a grassroots movement of diverse backgrounds, led by students, but not exclusive to students. Student activism has been pivotal in affecting change in the world. The civil rights movement in the 1960s, the anti-genocide movement with respect to the four in the early 2000s, and today we see it with Black Lives Matter and climate change. We have a social media presence, produced an impactful video, and we started to present to groups on campus prior to the pandemic. We want to be an impetus to bring together people of conscience to build a grassroots protest movement. Notwithstanding the immense political and economic clout of the Chinese government, we cannot be deterred from doing the right thing. This will not be a political movement of right versus left, but a movement of right versus wrong. Groups are starting to organize on a few campuses. We have proposed a large tent to track a coalition of student activists under one banner, called Stance, which you saw the logo before. Students take action now against China's extreme crimes. Although the heinous crime of mass incarceration and forced organ harvesting in China, most notably Uyghurs and Falun Gong, will be the most prominent, we want to attract other groups who suffered under the yoke of the ruthless Chinese regime, Tibetans, House Christians, political dissidents, dem democratic suppression in Hong Kong, and all their supporters. Thus, we are taking emph emphatically a stance against the legacy of serious human rights violation by this repressive regime. The sum is always greater than the parts. Our committee has published a mission statement and action plan as a template for student leaders. There were many programs that can be run to raise awareness, recruiting activists, lobbying university administrations, and medical schools to stop academic partnering with hospitals and institutions in China that are involved in forced organ harvesting, which is most hospitals, reaching out to other campuses, lobbying our own governments, and incrementally building a movement not just exclusive to students. The history of student movements starts slow, and then it accelerates as it receives media and public attention. Please visit our site at entransplantabuse.org for more information and contact information. China will soon be in the spotlight as it hosts the 2022 Winter Games in February. 
As the pandemic slows, we can use this as a leverage point to demonstrate at Chinese embassies and consulates, networking with other like-minded groups around the, the, the world. With the help of social media, perhaps a day will come when we'll have international days of protests. When our political leaders can no longer ignore China's despicable record of human rights violations. We, the ETAC Student Action Committee, want to be the connectors. We want to be the facilitators. It is worth noting that transformative change does not happen easily. Two days ago was Martin Luther King Day in the United States. So in his immortal words, let us remember, quote, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, unquote. We need to start pressing hard to bend that arc. We need to keep in mind it is not a sprint, but a marathon to affect real change. We need to be persistent and we need to be determined. The difference between making a difference or not is the resolute will to do it. It may seem like a daunting task, but history shows it can be done. We need to aim big. We can do it and we must do it. Thank you for the honor to speak. Thank you very much, Dr. Norman. I would like to introduce our next speaker, Enver Toheti. Enver was a surgeon in China and has testified regarding forced organ harvesting in many government hearings around the world. He also testified before the China Tribunal. Enver will be speaking about effects of advocacy in China. Please welcome Enver Toheti. Hi everyone, we're just bringing Enver into the room. Shouldn't be a moment. We haven't had any technical difficulties yet, so we'll see how we go. Enver, you should have received a, a message on your screen uh, to accept to come into the room. Okay. Well, while we're doing that, um, Anshu, maybe we can move on to our next speaker um, and we'll try and get Enver in in the meantime. Um, our next speaker is Nurgul. And Nurgul, please welcome. She will be speaking. Um, she's a speaker from Australian Uyghur community, Nurgul Sawad, who will present on forced organ harvesting advocacy. Please welcome Nurgul. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes, Nurgul, we can hear you. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Thanks, um, Susie and Anshu, organising um, this webinar. Uh, I personally know Susie's work for um, almost uh, three years now, and on and off we get in touch, and especially ETEC's wonderful uh, work um, they had done and the China Tribunal. So then we had on and off uh, this conversation about how, what we're going to do and what we need to do about uh, this uh, organ harvesting issues. Um, and we know it's happening. It's amongst the, the 
uh, the Uyghurs um, inside the China, especially inside the camp, and it could be in the prison system, could could be a labor camp system, um, could be above all. Um, so then we moved on, to, had a fair bit of chat on the halal organ harvesting issues, which picked up a little while ago, but and we really didn't have have a proper frame, framework and how we going to do how we going to do and absolutely safely and uh, with the um, certain and, and it has has to be certain like strong evidence based and how we going to carry on this campaign one is has to be research based and it very, you know, has to be investigative. Um, you know, the, the tools used in every possible way. On the other hand, and once uh, we have those evidence, how do we go? You know, present into relevant uh, policymakers and politicians, and even just pick up some of the the like professionals' brain on this issue and all these multiple, um, you know, the ways and the arenas and the you know the 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 alleyways, what we call in Australia, and how do we do it? And it is uh, quite a big um, uh, campaign, but once I hear how Canadian actually Freedom United is doing it, Marianne's presentation, and um, of course, uh, Susie's presentations, um, there's always a massive amount of uh, supportive information on the ETEX website. And as well as how systemically they set up um, this campaign, uh, you know, backup resources, and a plus, just by simply um, listening to Dr. Norman's uh, that's grassroots actions like student movement, and we cannot underestimate. So if I like literally um, just put few dot points, of what we can do in Australia is. Um, yes, we need to have such a legislation. What United States done in uh, December last year? It's a uh, stop forced organ harvesting bill, and uh, which is introduced by Senator Carlton, and um, and it, there was a quite fair bit of support because it's so close to end of year, and plus, uh, as we know, there's a you know the, the elections over now, new administration kicking in. I think everything kind of in standby. Now we know, as Susie said, it's going to reintroduce um, 2021. And the Canadian already got the bill. UK, you know, there's an amendment happening on the medicine and medical devices bill. And uh, whereas in Australia, we don't have anything. Um, so we need to come up with such a bill. And for in order to come up with such a bill, um, we need to have evidence and we need to have a strong network. We need to have a bring all the voices possible um, to work together in this issue. And so for me, um, as an Australian Uyghur and as well as member of Uyghur community, we cannot do these things alone. And the same thing we have done with Magnitsky Act, the same thing we have done with the uh, Foreign Relations Act and um, in the past, we we influence, we, we send our, you know, um, our expectation our messages to the MPs who are actually interested in the issue at the time. And um, so when it comes to uh, like a stopping for force organ harvesting bill, it has to happen exactly the same way because we have successful three cases before us. Um, we, we made it happen. So the, the, I would like to point it out for top down three things. One is upper level interaction. And there's always a bunch of people in Australia. Are they the brainstormers? And they the policymakers, policy advisors. They constantly think what sort of policy we need in Australia, and we need to have access to those people, those those brainstormers, and um, making sure we communicate with it. We're sending our message deep into that uh, brain level, and this is one thing. Secondly, at the MPs. Um, Politicians that they hear, but they don't analyze. So if we kind of combine those policymakers' brain with the MPs, uh, you know, their, their, their attention and their 
the attitude towards the this key issue, this can happen because they will listen to their own policy advisors. Of course, if we work in a both ways, so they can see what's in front of them and also what sort of advice they're actually hearing from those advisors. And at the same time, the number three is mobilizing community network. And the reason I said is when we work on a Belt and Road Initiative, how are we going to stop it in Australia, especially in the Victoria, they picked up so dramatically and spreading New South Wales, Queensland, even Western Australia. And for me, this foreign relations bill just came on time, but we never actually give up and we mobilized all the network, um, all net, when I say network, is all network who are victims of CCP. And we uh, we joined our energy together, we work together, very coordinated, and we send out the message to all the MPs who actually really paying attention to um, Belt and Road Initiative, and as well as the whole Belt and Road Initiative, uh, you know, how it's unfolding in Victoria. So that's how it started. And there's a gradually expansion New South Wales and Queensland and so on. So for me, this campaign is not much different from what we have done uh, with the previous couple of other bills. So we need to have those um, community networks. And especially we just touched on Falun Gong community. Falun Gong community has been working on this uh, forced organ harvesting for years. Oh, uh, more than two decades, they have massive uh, experience and as well as a framework and pretty much we can utilize, we can actually learn from them and um, expand on that landscape. And um, so for me, um, especially when it comes to Uyghur, uh, you know, the, the, the forced organ harvesting issues amongst the Uyghur prisoners and uh, uh, detainees inside a mass concentration camp, it's, it's, it's a new. And we knew it's happening, but it's new. And uh, so therefore we need to have a hard evidence, very solid hard evidence. Secondly, we also kind of start building our, that network and a framework, um, you know, based on a previous experience and based on what we have got and, and the conjoined all above are together. So we have to work all the parts at the same time. And also something about Freedom United, um, they mentioned about um, like how do we keep those, um, force, you know, stop force organ harvesting this whole event in the public eyes. And social media is a such a powerful tool. And uh, once it's out, it's out. It's in the public eyes and it's, it's public space. Everyone will watch, everyone will read. So therefore, for me in Australia, we need to do the similar thing. Um, it's whether it's petition or whether it's a, it's a certain social media based campaign. And once we have kicked out this and that so people will know paying attention to this whole like a forced organ housing business happening inside of China, it's the most cruel and inhumane possible way. And if people don't know, if we don't educate public, public when I say public, it's a wider public, uh, we don't get enough support uh, from uh, Australian public. It's, it's beyond us. So this is not only just the victims of communism or victims of CCP we're talking about. We, I'm talking about 25 million Australian public. That's the public I'm referring to. That's why it's for me, um, majority of people are in social media. So, and I will, I would really put stress on, we should not underestimate also public uh, social media campaign when it comes to, um, you know, the forced organ harvesting and the halal organ harvesting, either way, both issues. I think I may stop here and I'm happy to pass on my conversation over to Anva as a medical professional and who worked uh, in the Chinese prison system, even medical system, and he has more evidence-based um, you know, discussion he can present to everyone, all the participants. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nurgul. 
Now we have Enver. I hope the connection will work. Please welcome Enver Tohiti. Hi, Enver. How are you going? Can you click on that link there? Let's hopefully get you through this time. I've messaged him and he said he's got the link. Sometimes we have these difficulties, don't we, with technology. Just wait a moment. Thanks for your patience, everyone. If we can get Ember in the room. Mm, looks like we're still having difficulty. Just give Amber just a moment longer if you can just um, wait a moment and then we might need to go to uh, Dr. Aliyah Khan if we can't get Amber in just yet. Let's send him a message. Hey, Embercil seems like he's having trouble, but we've got a little bit of time left. So let's um, maybe, uh, Andrew, we can move on. Please welcome uh, Dr. Alia Khan to provide us information on an important later campaign. Thank you very much, uh, Anshu, and thank you, Susie and, e and ETAC. Uh, for organizing this very important webinar. And it really is my honor to uh, speak to you all uh, today. Uh, can you hear me? Everyone can hear me and the audiovisual is working good? Okay, perfect. I just wanted to say that uh, it really is my pleasure to speak on behalf of Canadians in support of refugees in dire need. And this is an organization which advocates for the most oppressed and persecuted people around the world. And we believe that every life is precious, regardless of race or religion. And we have really been concerned uh, regarding forced organ harvesting. This is such a cruel and barbaric uh, practice, this must be stopped. And we have also seen um, recently, over the past few years, the development of concentration camps in uh, China's uh, northern province of Xinjiang. And there is evidence of more than one million Uyghurs being forcefully held in these concentration camps. And this is actually the largest mass detention since the time of the Holocaust. Unfortunately, we see the a similar pattern of what was seen in the Holocaust, medical experimentation, forced organ harvesting, evidence of torture, forced sterilization, rape and child separation. And the children are being placed in orphanages and they are also undergoing severe and extreme torture and persecution. And unfortunately are also victims of forced organ harvestry. Uh, we've also seen um, a slavery, forced labor, and this is akin to black slavery in the U.S. And the U.S. has now recognized the genocide of the Uyghur people. This just happened, as you know, in January um, 2021. So following on the heels of the China Tribunal final judgment, which was in March 2020, this extensive document provides evidence of China's horrific campaign of forced organ harvesting. And it was described by uh, the China Tribunal a Chairman, Sir Jeffrey Nice, as the greatest possible breach of a person's human rights. And um, we know that the Uyghur people have also unfortunately joined uh, the Falun Gong as being victims of forced organ harvesting. And also other victims are the Tibetan Christians and the House Christians. And we have reports that the Uyghur people have been subjected to forcefully giving blood and also have had organ imaging done. And they are basically serving like a massive biobank. 
and uh, with this uh, blood sampling, uh, it is possible to do DNA analysis of the entire genome and determine that individual suitability for organ transplantation and organ harvesting. And by matching with DNA analysis, this can reduce the rejection rates by 70%. Whereas with accidental death, there isn't enough time to do DNA analysis. By taking this massive, massive large group of people and subjecting them uh, to blood testing and organ imaging, we are actually preparing them to serve as a bank for organs. And this is such a horrific crime. And this is reminiscent of what happened in the Holocaust where medical experimentation took place. And um, we've seen that organs are being uh, offered um, within a few weeks. This can only happen in the presence of an organized, orchestrated uh, process where there is already a pre-selected individualization of DNA analysis, organ imaging, and the person is selected to be killed with sacrifice of their vital organs. As physicians, we have taken the Hippocratic Oath. And that oath is that we must preserve and protect life and do no harm. And as physicians, we cannot participate or be complicit in such a horrific crime. And we cannot remain silent. And as Dr. Epstein said, if we're remaining silent, we are participating. We are enabling and allowing these horrific crimes to occur. And we as physicians must unequivocally condemn these genocidal crimes against humanity and take any actions and all actions to eliminate any possible complicit involvement in forced organ harvesting. CSRDN has a letter posted on the website, um, and this allows uh, physicians to uh, sign and add their name to condemning forced organ harvesting. And we have more than 1,500 North American physicians who have signed this letter. And we'd like to see this uh, uh, type of an initiative be taken across the globe. We as physicians must stand united around the globe against these horrific, cruel, and barbaric crimes. And it is important for us in each of our respective countries to introduce legislature which bans transplant tourism. We must all take actions to end forced organ harvesting and the genocide of the Uyghur people. So I really want to um, you know, commend uh, the great work that is being done by ETAC. And um, thank you for this opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alia Khan. Um, we have Enver again. I would like to reintroduce Enver so that uh, we, he can go. Enver was a surgeon in China, and he has testified regarding post-organ harvesting in many government hearings around the world. He also testified before the China Tribunal. Enver, Enver will be speaking about effects of advocacy in China. Please welcome Enver to AT. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Ah, okay. Okay, sorry. Um, I am quite good on, on a computer, but I don't know why. It, it keep asking me to reset password, reset password, oh my God. Okay, anyway. Well, thank you for everyone for this opportunity. Um, I have been uh, joining this uh, campaigning since 2009, and now it's more than a decade has passed. Well, thank you for all your support that we have achieved a lot. Impact on the topic is quite visible. And at the beginning, however, at the beginning, I was quite naively believed that I am only against the hideous crime happening in China. And I was blaming the CCP for blocking our campaigning, making our life busy with nothing, until I saw the reaction from the West, this super-powered um, giant companies. 
There's one example. This is an article published on a New York Times. It says Nike and Coca-Cola lobby against Xinjiang forced labor bill. It's by Anna Swanson, published in November 29, 2020. It says business groups and major companies like Apple have been pressing Congress to alter legislation cracking down on imports of goods made with forced labor from persecuted Muslim minority in China. This reminds me a Chinese phrase. It says, if there's a bag of gold on the negotiation table, then everything can be secondary. I thought I was only fighting against the CCP. Now I realize that I have created even bigger enemies out there. They are the rich and the powerful recipients. We all know that uh, organs are the essential for the extension of lives. But to eat another species to survive is the law of the jungle, even though those species do not kill their own. Not only, but not only to eat other species, but also to kill their own to survive is unique to highest species on the food chain. That is us, that is the human being. And the only human beings are capable of killing their own for their own survival. So, the CCP has outlet the virus in 2019, and it has brought the world economy to its knees, including the Chinese economy. At the beginning of the pandemic, governments around the world vowed to compensation from the China. The CCP, on the other hand, has showed its confidence. They know that when the pandemic is over, the whole world will kneel down to them again. We can see that now. That's, this piece of news is taken from European Commission press release on 30th of December, 2020, Brussels. It says, EU and China reach agreement in principle on investment. This has assured the much needed blood for Chinese economy, of course, for the EU too, but human rights values has once again been to the second level. That is very unfortunate. However, against all the odds that I'm not saying we have achieved nothing, it is quite opposite our against uh, organ harvesting campaign has had and is having enormous impact on the CCP's organ business. According to my sources, that now having new new pair of organs is no longer impossible to achieve for the ordinary people, even Uyghur people in Xinjiang. I have heard a few of them had organ for free. That is disturbing, alarming news. Because before, and you have to have money to pay for it. To, to pay for it. Now, it can be paid by, by medical insurance and it's a state-free medical system. What is that meaning? That means the organ harvesting as a industry is running on its full scale. And then for those who benefit from it is a great news because they have no idea what's going on. But for the victim is a disaster. This phenomenon shows that success of our campaign campaigning that we may have made the overseas market less demanding. Of course, the reality is much more complicated, but since the size of population in China, and since that the organ harvesting has been industrialized, 
that it will sustain the business that makes our job even harder. Because this organ harvesting now, it is a full scale running uh, industrial. If they stop it, and there are many doctors, nurses, many, many people, they will lose their job. This is, this is kind of, you know, scary scenarios. For that, there are many um, people in China, they ignore the hideous part of this um, business. They keep this going. And uh, many people, when they receive free organs, they're happy because their life has been extended. After and uh, uh, before I was campaigning for this uh, organ against organ harvesting, I was campaigning for the victim of the nuclear test. So both I had been campaigning for the victims for 20 years. And the 20 years campaigning has made me to realize how dark is, how ugly is that a human dark side of human being. Yeah, that's what I want to say, because I said too much, it will be too negative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Enver, and thank you, everyone. There is another poll link shared on your screen. Just click on the link to read the question and submit your answers. We will now quickly move on to our Q&A session. If you have any questions for one of the speakers, please enter into the Q&A that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Due to the time limit, we have only one or two questions, and we do really apologize that we have gone over time. Uh, we will finish up in very few in short minutes and a few minutes. Hi, it looks like we do have a, a question there. Let me just have a quick look. So the first question is, um, a lot of people are removed from the transplant list um, because they die because before the transplant, but could also go elsewhere to get an organ. Do you think official transplant centres can help to sensitise not to go to China to get an organ? So I might just um, ask Norman um, if he would be interested in, in answering that question. Are you there, Norman? Yes. Um, transplant, um, so from what I understand, just to, to review the question, um, um, stopping trans, you know, um, transplant centers um, in, in, in uh, connecting with uh, transplant centers in China? Is that what I'm, the question is? Because it wasn't entirely clear to me. Sure. I think the question is asking, do you think that official transplant centers outside of China um, yes. could be involved okay. in, in stopping people from going from, for an organ? Um... Yeah, well, I think this is a very, okay, so that's, uh, that's a very important point. I mean, I think as a physician, and as uh, Dr. Khan has said, it is unconscionable that there are physicians that are complicit in uh, orchest state orchestrated forced organ harvesting. Um, and this hasn't happened since the Holocaust. Um, I think without question that we need to have uh, stronger advocacy by transplant organizations, the World Transplant uh, Society, and transplant societies in all um, Western or human rights respecting countries, that this is unacceptable. Um, but also um, all kinds of medical uh, organizations. And we have to also avoid having these academic interactions with, um, you know, with hospitals in, in China. Um, that will make certain that the message is clear to them 
that we know what's going on and that we will no longer tolerate it. Um, and of course, the important part of, um, of uh, legislation in which S204 is now, we're trying to expedite in Canada, but we, and we have five democracies so far that have, um, um, you know, um, passed legislation. And the legislation says unquestionably that anybody who is seeking uh, an organ from forced organ harvesting, and of course, we talk about it globally, but the focus is definitely on, on China. This is an indictable crime, and there will be consequences. So, I mean, we there advocacy can happen as on a multi-pronged way, but there's no doubt that transplant societies have to be much clearer. There are some members of the transplant community that have their head in the sand because they've had inter academic interactions over the over the years, and they deny that it's even exists. This is like genocide denial, Holocaust denial, or whatever. This is unacceptable. And but there are other members of transplant society who realize that they have to have a stronger message to China that this is unacceptable, and to and to their own public that seeking um, organs this way is a heinous act. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Norman, for that answer. Um, there's one uh, more question here, and we've gone over time, so we will actually um, finish up in just a moment. Uh, our other uh, three speakers, I'm going to uh, give you this last comment for your opinion, and if you can give a um, sort of 20 second answer or just a comment each, that'd be a really fantastic way to finish. So. I'm not sure if you're still there, Aaliyah, but if anyone's um, still with us, because I know Aaliyah was very busy today. Um, so the comment for your opinion is uh, from Graham Barber. Uh, China can't be shamed. Uh, action from like-minded nations must hurt the CCP, primarily by economic sanctions, withdrawing from the Olympics, Magnitsky leg legislation, defense of Taiwan, etc. Um, would you like to give um, a comment uh, on that on that opinion on that statement? Are you there, Aaliyah? Um, let's try for um, Nurgle. Are you there, Nurgle? Uh, yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, thanks. Okay. But am I right? The uh, statement was we need to work with the like minded states who oppose or sanction against China. Is that the question? That's how I. This, the statement was um, about, I, I guess, in, in quote marks, hurting China um, by, you know, taking all of these actions across, I suppose, different issues and using sanctions and, and strong sort of, you know, uh, responses. And, and what is your opinion on that? Um, here's the thing. Um, we're not talking about we're buying Coca-Cola from supermarkets, we're buying clothes from the shops, and we're buying that um, our day-to-day, -day, um, that's, uh, you know, consumer goods, the organ harvesting is very um, the sensitive. Um, the issue at the same time, it's crime, and don't forget this is only we're talking about small numbers of people who has that um, demand. And um, in us, if if I just as simply says in Australia, if we tell those small numbers of people, uh, don't go to China, don't get uh, you know the 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 organ um, you know the, the donation or purchase and whichever way we know it's crime. Um, but we need to give them alternatives. What's the alternative if they don't go there and it's either they have to choose to die, just you know, there's no immediate um, you know, available any organs in the near future. I know there's a waiting list. Um, so we as as Norman said, as we, we need to have a system. We need to have that a system where it's the one is functional, one is convincing, and also the most critical part is ethical. And uh, if we know we have that, uh, you know, the healthy uh, supply in our own country, own land, 
the people would not actually go to China to reach out to those uh, black market or underground or whatever the um, uh, state run, uh, you know, organ, um, you know, the trade and you know, secret trade. Um, this is the one way of my um, input in there. And secondly, um, we need to keep tell people this is a, it's it, we we have to name out this is a crime. This is a heinous crime. What China actually doing it? If we don't spell out and name out properly, and still, as um, you know, the few other people mentioned, is like people just are putting their stick their hand like an ostrich in the inside the sand. It's they pretend they didn't hear. They pretend they didn't know. It's actually happening. And now, and because um, the like. Um, the, the we some people say one one million, some people say one point eight million. Um, we know it's more than that, and the, the, we our Uyghur community in diaspora we are um, actually confident to say there's obviously three million people actually in the concentration camp. They're not going to get out. They will not get out, and uh, China and uh, try to you know to pretty much crush those. Uh, over three million people, one way or the other, either forced labour, just to use them, pretty much down to the almost like a, as a, as a dead body, release the dead body, not the alive, and also organ harvesting and other uh, you know parts that are hacking, and we know there's a medical experiments is happening, and so whichever way you look at. Um, unfortunately, China has that massive the base there. They can actually have that high supply. Um, so we're looking at this a supply a supply reduction or the, you know demand reduction, and um, you can do the demand reduction by all the working with all the states. At the same time, we still have to target China, name shame, pull it out, and international community needs to know that. So this is my um, like unfinished, um, you know, um, answers. This is this is not. We cannot just use one word or one sentence to wrap up this. This is actually ongoing a struggle, an ongoing battle, and we're going to keep going on this battle for quite some time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nagel. Um, look, I, I'll hand back over to Anshu in, in just a moment. Uh, there are a couple of other questions and we've run out of time. It would be really fantastic to stay on longer. Uh, but instead of answering those now, what we'll do is when we send the email out to you all, we'll actually uh, put those questions and some answers there for you to make sure that everyone gets their, their questions and others get to hear your question as well. Um, I think uh, you know the comments that have been made today are really important, and it is a very serious issue. It's a very difficult issue, and I'd like to sort of leave a, a comment that um, you know we can take inspiration from the Falun Gong practitioners, so the Chinese Falun Gong community who have been battling this for over 20 years, and they have not given up. Uh, and I think that's really important uh, that we can actually make ground. The issues move from something that was underground to something that is now a lot of people have heard about it. And um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can help. And we really hope that, you know, you'll at least even sort of link in with the social media campaign. But I'll pass on to Anshu now and, and thank you very much. Thank you, Susie. And thank you, everyone. Next month, ETAC will begin a three-part webinar series followed by Advocacy at Skills. The first webinar is called Advocacy, Advocacy Essential, followed by Business and Human Rights as a core issue when addressing forced organ harvesting and social media advocacy skills. We'll be in touch with you soon with more information on this series, and we'll send you an information sheet on today's webinar so you can contribute to the different initiative presented if you would like to. We'll also distribute the evidence resources that she mentioned. Thank you everyone for attending today. We hope to hear from you soon. Thank you. Have a good day.